everyone and welcome to today's lecture on protein function. I again just want to remind you that the way these lectures will work is that after each slide I will have a chalkboard notes recap of what I would have written on the board for you to jot down as your notes for the lesson for that slide uh, had we been in the classroom. At the beginning of a lot of these lectures, I like to throw in a fun fact to kind of relate what we're looking at to some of the interesting health implications or uh, historical implications. And so this slide is to show us how ubain arrows relate to the topic of protein function. Uh, tribes actually used to use ubain tipped arrows as poison arrows, and they got that from plant extracts. So let me just grab the laser. Uh, so if you see the plant right here, they were able to extract ubain from that plant, and then they would use it for the tips of these arrows. And the reason why they do that is because it's an inhibitor of the sodium potassium. ATPase transporter protein. And we're going to look at how that works later on. But basically what it did in terms of the poison arrow is it affects the heart muscle's ability to relax. So the heart muscle will contract, but it cannot relax in order to produce another contraction. Okay, so basically when people constantly tell me to relax and I just can't, uh, that's kind of like what Ubain does to your heart muscles. So what's interesting about that, though, is basically, you know, you have this historical use of Ubain as a poison arrow, and yet they've now developed ways to use it in the medical field because in small controlled doses, you can actually use it as a heart stimulant if the heart has trouble contracting. And so in the medical field, what would you want to use that for? Well, regulating blood pressure. Okay. So again, the main idea is that Ubain is inhibiting the sodium potassium ATPase transporter protein and affecting the heart's ability to relax after contraction. And we're going to look at that a little bit later on in this lesson. Now, when we talk about protein function, there's five major functional classes of proteins. And they're highlighted in this figure here. So you have metabolic enzymes that are going to be involved in metabolism. And we're going to go through all of the different metabolism pathways later on in this course. And then you have structural proteins, okay, which as their name suggests, defines the structure of a cell. Then you have transport proteins. And these are the ones that are embedded in various membranes. And again, that's something else that we're going to go through in more detail throughout the different lessons. You have cell signaling proteins responsible for the various cascades. And you notice that we've mentioned in a previous lecture that cell signaling is highly defined or, or characterized by receptors and ligands. So ligands bind to receptors to trigger cell signaling. And then you have my baby, my pride and joy, the genomic caretaker protein. So the proteins involved in DNA maintenance or gene expression, things like polymerases for replication, for uh, transcription, things like uh, HATS and HDACs and various other regulators that you're going to talk about in the later portion of biochem. So the first category that I mentioned before were the metabolic uh, proteins and metabolic function. So there are a lot of different enzymes involved in metabolism. These will basically have the purpose to catalyze the reactions of metabolic uh, flux and to control reactions throughout uh, the synthesis and breakdown of various molecules. Now, when you think about enzymes, some of the things I want you to remember from your other classes that you should know about them already is that they work by lowering the activation energy without 
changing free energy. Okay, And that's something else that we cover in more detail in one of the other chapters in this lecture. Uh, they also will be responsible for increasing the rate of product formation, which is why they're so valuable to us. And at the end of the day, they're not usually changed in the reaction itself. And since we're talking about metabolism, again, you're going to be looking at reactions that are involved in the synthesis and degradation of macromolecules. You then have structural proteins, and I want you to circle star highlight that these are known for being the most abundant proteins in the body. And the reason why they're the most abundant proteins in the body is specifically because of collagen being so incredibly uh, robust and, and, and abundant. And collagen is the primary component of connective tissues. It it's basically what gives strength to your tendons, your cartilage, your bones, your teeth. Okay. Now, in addition to um, thinking of collagen, I also want you to think of other examples that include uh, cytoskeletal proteins, which you saw in the figure a few slides ago when all of the different categories were first introduced, uh, actin and tubulin, myosin, and so later on, when we look at muscle contraction, these structural pro uh, proteins will be very important for muscles to be able to contract and, you know, for you to get those gains at the gym. Two of the other categories we mentioned for the functions of proteins were transport and cell signaling. First of all, for transport, we mentioned that these are proteins embedded in membranes. There are two basic classes. There will be passive transporters, and we're not talking about passive aggressive, like most people accuse me of being. Uh, passive, we talk about not requiring energy, and usually you see things flowing in the natural high to low uh, intended gradient. And then you have active transporters, which means, you know, just like if you picture an active person, these are going to require energy and they tend to rely on things like ATP hydrolysis or an ion gradient. Now, when we talk about cell signaling, there are three major types of proteins that I want you to think of. There are membrane receptors. And when we talk about membrane receptors, we're going to go through uh, two large classes, usually the G protein coupled receptors, which include things like epinephrine and prostaglandin receptors. And then there are the receptor tyrosine kinases, which include what we'll see when we look at insulin. Now, in addition to membrane receptors, the other two major types of cell signaling proteins are nuclear receptors and intracellular signaling proteins. Okay, and at some point, we'll go over kinases and phosphatases, um, but for now, we're just generally introducing these different types of proteins. And then we get to my babies, my pride and joy, the genomic caretaker proteins. And just like their name suggests, they're in charge of taking care of your genome. And so they will protect the integrity of the genome. They'll include enzymes for replication, repair, recombination, uh, things like I mentioned before, like polymerases. There's SSB, which is single strand binding protein, which basically prevents the double strands from re-ligating together whenever you have to unzip them. Uh, there's HATS and HDACs, which are the histone acetyltransferases and deacetyltransferases, and those are involved in epigenetics. And you'll go through all of those at the very end sections of this course. Now, whenever we talk about proteins, we always mention how 
structure defines function and you'll notice that sometimes having certain molecules bind to proteins can then trigger conformational changes. And two big important proteins that are regulated in this way are myoglobin and hemoglobin. And as you know, these are involved in transporting oxygen. So they're involved in oxygen for your blood and for your tissues throughout the body. Now, one of the historical facts of these two proteins is that they were the first proteins that had their structures determined by X-ray crystallography. Now, when we look at these proteins, I'm going to grab the laser. There are two critical residues to be able to bind that oxygen so that you can transport it throughout the body. You have the proximal histidine and you have the distal histidine. Okay, and they call that distal E7 and this one uh, proximal you see over here F8. And basically the proximal one is coordinating with the iron of heme. And you see the heme group here, the iron in the middle, the blue circle. And you have oxygen coordinating with the iron as well. And then the distal one will coordinate with the oxygen. Okay, so proximal coordinating with iron of heme, then you have oxygen, then you have the distal um, histidine. Now, when you look at the heme group, what's interesting with the conformational change is seen over here. So in this first figure, you have heme without the oxygen bound to it, and you notice it's a puckered, uh, basically large atomic radius of the, the iron atom, okay? And then oxygen binding, so you see the arrow down here, once you have oxygen bound to that, that iron, uh, you end up reducing the radius of the iron and you form what's called a planar, which, you know, straight like a plane, okay? So it goes from puckered to uh, a straight planar heme and when you look at this conformational change, this is important because it means that different affinities exist. And affinity is basically, you know, how much something likes something else, how much it wants to bind to it, doesn't want to bind to it. And when you have different conformational forms, depending on whether something's bound or not, it tells you that it allows for that binding, in this case, the binding of oxygen, to be reversible. Okay, so you're able to pick up or grab oxygen and hold it on the heme, but you're also able to change conformation and be able to release it and not have oxygen. So it's a reversible ability, which is critical to the function of myoglobin and hemoglobin, because you want them to be able to both pick up and grab oxygen, but also to release it to wherever it needs to go. Okay, now speaking of that iron of heme, you know, binding and, and releasing oxygen, there's actually a pretty cool connection to everyday life. And that's when you look at meat, for instance, in a grocery store or even in your own kitchen or on your counter when you're going to cook. Um, you, you may wonder, well, why does meat end up turning brown as it's, you know, getting older, sits out on the counter? Sometimes you'll see people sifting through the, the uh, packages of meat at the grocery store trying to find, you know, the brightest red one, the, the most robustly pink looking one, because that, you know, is seen as the precious one. And so basically the concept behind the different colors that you might see of meat is based on you know, the, the binding of oxygen to the iron group. So we have various colors that you might end up seeing. Like I said, the bright red one, that would be the, the fresh, healthy one. That's basically oxygen will only bind to iron when the iron is in the plus two conformation, the plus two state. And you have that in healthy living tissues. And so when the meat is fresher and closer to that time when, you know, the tissues were lively and have a lot of bound oxygen, uh, 
uh, you're going to see that reddish, that nice red color. And basically bound oxygen helps prevent the oxidation to the ferric state of iron. And the ferric is the plus three state. Now in dead cells, oxidation of iron to the ferric plus three state ends up occurring and you see that over here and so you'll notice that it's holding water instead of oxygen and so you see that browning as you end up with iron in the plus three ferric state now sometimes you will also see a purple purplish red which is seen in vacuum packed meat and the reason that is is that when it's vacuum packed it's still in the plus two conformation, but if you picture a vacuum or vacuum sealed, that means that there's no oxygen there. So it does not have oxygen bound to it. So it's not gonna be the bright red color that you see when you have the plus two state and the oxygen bound. Now, there's one other concept related to this that I want you to write down in your notes and circle star highlight. And that's the idea of when you see processed meats and you notice that when you're looking at processed meats like pepperoni for instance or other uh, types of products like that they stay really red for a really long time like a lot longer than a fresh meat at the, the the meat counter would stay and the reason that is is that they use carbon monoxide in order to process them to keep them red for long times and the way that that works is carbon monoxide actually binds to hemoglobin or myoglobin in the same way that oxygen does but it's at a 200 times stronger ability and so if it has such a strong affinity to bind it will actually displace oxygen from the the myoglobin or the hemoglobin Okay, and so now you end up having that really tightly bound and, and kept it, keeping the meat red for a much longer amount of time. Now, when we talk about things like hemoglobin binding uh, something like oxygen, there are different conformations, kind of like we mentioned a moment ago with, you know, puckered and planar. And so I want to show you the concept of T and R state conformations of hemoglobin. T stands for tense. Uh, think if, you know, if you're a very tense person and very serious, you want people to stay away from you. So you have the tense state, and that basically has a lot less affinity for oxygen. Uh, oxygen is going to be unbound. So you can see, uh, let me grab the laser. You can see here how you have the T state starting off um, unbound and it's gonna have a less affinity for oxygen, oxygen. And when we talk about affinity, it means how much something likes something. So kind of like students have a very high affinity for me and they want to follow me around and they wanna be in all of my classes. And when I am in the T state, I am like, no, no, stay away, please stay away. <laughs> and, and then you have the R state, which stands for relaxed. And I always tell students think, you know, R, relaxed, think stoner kind of love, like, oh, I love everything. I love everyone. Uh, I want to be, you know, hugged by all. And so with that one, that's when there is more affinity for oxygen and the hemoglobin really wants to bind it. And so you're gonna see in these figures of models of how hemoglobin can switch from T state to R state or over here, T state down to R state. Uh, and it, it kind of fluctuates, you know, there's the sequential mode, there's a concrete model, various things, but ultimately, one of the kind of concepts that you see in models about T state conformation versus R state is that the binding of oxygen, so here there's no oxygen bound yet. Once oxygen starts to bind, and you notice the circle formation represents relaxed, which has higher affinity, you notice that once that oxygen binds, the 
the subunits that are adjacent to it because you know proteins have multiple subunits so the subunits that are adjacent to it are now more likely to want to bind more of that oxygen or in the case of L being ligand so you see how you started off binding ligand or oxygen here and now you're starting to want to bind more ligand right next to it until each of the subunits are now all in the R state, the relaxed state, and they have a high affinity for that oxygen and they're really holding on to it. Okay, we're not going to go into the details of the mechanisms of the conformational changes and all the different models. I just want you to be aware of T versus R, what it actually means. So, tense state, low affinity for oxygen, its subunits do not want to bind oxygen versus our state where they're relaxed and they now have oxygen bound and they want to hold on to it. There's a high affinity. So now when we talk about proteins binding their ligand, like in the previous slide when we were looking at hemoglobin binding oxygen and you know whether it wanted to be bound and had a high affinity or if it didn't want binding and it had low affinity we can use binding equations we can use constants called dissociation constant which is k subscript d over here or association constant which is k subscript a and when you think of something dissociating, it is separating, kind of like if a person's dissociating, they're separating from reality at that moment. Uh, and when you look at the dissociation constant equation, you'll notice that up here on the numerator, you have the protein and the ligand separate from each other. That represents when they are dissociated and when there is a low affinity for that ligand and protein, meaning they don't want to be bound to each other. And then the denominator down here, that's protein and ligand together, okay? So they are associated. So with KD, if you see a high KD, that tells you the numerator is very high. That means that there is low affinity for binding that ligand or low affinity between those two structures because they want to be separate if this is high up here. Now, the association constant is the opposite of this fraction here. So association constant would have product ligand together on the numerator, on the top of the fraction, okay? Because these two are inverse to each other. What you can do to think about, you know, KD versus KA is for KA, think of that little A, the association A, as affinity. So Ka is all about affinity, high affinity, wanting to be together. If you have a high Ka, there is high affinity. If you have a low Ka, there is low affinity. Whereas Kd is about dissociating, wanting to be separate. So a high Kd is actually a low affinity okay because they want to be separate a low kd is high affinity okay because they do not want to be separate okay so make sure to kind of practice or know those four scenarios what does it mean if you have high kd low kd high ka low ka you don't have to worry about memorizing the fraction itself or or working with that equation, I just want you to know the significance of the terminology and what it means if you encounter it. So when we talk about KD, I want to show you how you can determine KD by studying what's called a fractional saturation, or you see the, the symbol theta here. The fractional saturation curve. So when you look at one of these curves and you're looking at various proteins on that curve, you can find the KD by going to where the fractional saturation is 0.5 and find what the ligand concentration 
at that 0.5 uh, fractional saturation is on your curve. So notice here for protein A, when you go to the fractional saturation of 0.5, and then you look down over here, the ligand concentration is 10. So you notice that is the KD for protein A. For protein B, when you go to 0.5 saturation, you go all the way until you hit protein B's curve, and you look at what ligand concentration that is, and it's 60. Now, a moment ago, we mentioned that with KD, the higher the KD is, the more dissociated, meaning more separated things are. So they're low affinity. So when you look at two different curves, you notice the curve that is more to the left of the fractional saturation graph is going to have a higher affinity for binding that ligand because it has, you notice, a lower KD, okay? Less dissociation, more association, okay? So when you look at two curves, if a curve is shifted to the left, it has higher affinity for whatever it's binding. And so when you look at this curve here and you're comparing the black line of myoglobin versus that pink line of hemoglobin, what do you notice? Well, myoglobin is shifted more toward the left. That tells you it has much greater, a much higher affinity for the ligand, which in this case is oxygen. And if you think about it, myoglobin is the one that is holding oxygen in tissues. So you want it to have a high affinity for that oxygen. You want it to hold on to it. Whereas hemoglobin, you want it to have a lower affinity for oxygen because you want it to be willing to give up that oxygen to myoglobin, who has the higher affinity and will then grab that oxygen in the tissues. Okay, so this is kind of visual representation of something that we mentioned earlier. So earlier we mentioned that myoglobin has greater affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin. Now you see how it works on a fractional saturation curve. So now I want to review this concept with the fetal hemoglobin graph, okay? And so this shows a curve for myoglobin, which we said is going to be what is grabbing and holding on to oxygen in tissues. And then we have hemoglobin here. We have F, so hemoglobin F is the fetal hemoglobin, and then we have the A, which is the adult hemoglobin, okay? So these are the two that proteins that are responsible for grabbing oxygen in the lungs and then bringing it to the tissues where they give it to myoglobin to oxygenate the tissues. So now, two concepts I wanna show you on this graph. First of all, when you are looking at an individual curve, okay, individual curve, when you look at the lower portion of the curve, you notice that this axis here, this is oxygen saturation, so the lower portion of the curve is when there is less, less oxygen bound to that protein. And then the higher portion of the curve, you have more oxygen saturation, more oxygen bound to that protein. So you'll notice that hemoglobin has less oxygen bound to it when it's in the tissues because it should have given away that oxygen to the myoglobin. And then it's got a lot of oxygen bound to it when it is in the lungs over here because it should be grabbing oxygen at the lungs to bring it to the tissues. Now you notice myoglobin on the other hand is very high up here when it's in the peripheral tissues because this guy is the one that should have lots of oxygen bound to it in the tissues. It's oxygenating those uh, tissues, okay? So an individual graph high on the, uh, an individual curve on this graph. High up here is where you have lots of oxygen. Low down here is low. Now, again, remember we said that when you're looking at one of these graphs, the curves most to the left have the highest affinity for the ligand being bound. 
So what you notice on this curve, first of all, myoglobin has the highest affinity out of the three proteins we're looking at for oxygen. And that makes sense because you want myoglobin to be oxygen hungry and really hold on to the oxygen in the tissues. And we've mentioned before, myoglobin has greater affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin. Now on this curve, when you compare fetal hemoglobin and adult hemoglobin, what do you notice? Fetal is more toward the left compared to the adult, which means that fetal hemoglobin has a greater affinity for oxygen, which makes sense because what do you want the fetal hemoglobin to do? You want it to grab oxygen from mom. You want to promote the transfer of oxygen from the mother to the baby. And the way to do that is to have the mother have a lower affinity for that oxygen compared to the baby. Because if the baby has higher affinity, it's going to grab that oxygen. It wants it. It loves it more than mama does. So that is very valuable to fetal abilities. Okay? So make sure you're very comfortable with looking at a graph and seeing where does the location of the curve tell us uh, in terms of the oxygen or the ligand binding and affinity and the properties of that protein. Okay, so that now brings us to the Bohr effect. And what the Bohr effect states is that hemoglobin affinity for oxygen is inversely related to acidity and carbon dioxide concentration. So that basically tells you if conditions are more acidic, which would be a lower pH, so more acidic, you will have lower affinity for oxygen. Okay. If situations are less acidic, you will have more affinity, okay? So they're inversely related. If you have high acidity, you have low affinity. If you have low acidity, you have high affinity. And the way that you can look at this on this graph to kind of think about hemoglobin and what it's doing is, well, look at the pH with the blood of the lungs. So pH of 7.6 tends to be the pH of blood in the lungs. That is a higher pH than you find with blood in the tissues, which is 7.2 usually. So if you have a higher pH, that means you are less acidic, okay? So less acidic in the lungs, which tells you what about affinity? Well, they're inversely related. So less acidic means more affinity, okay? And you want hemoglobin to have more affinity for oxygen in the lungs because you want it to pick up oxygen from the lungs. And then what do you want to happen in the tissues? You want the hemoglobin to give up, let go of that oxygen when it's in the tissues. So you want lower affinity. And what do you notice about the tissues? It has higher acidity, okay? So higher acidity gives your hemoglobin less affinity for the oxygen when it's in the tissues and boom, it wants to let go of it, give that oxygen up to those tissues, okay? Okay, so the last thing to mention about oxygen affinity and unloading is the impact of temperature or altitude on the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. And when you think of the affinity for oxygen, you can also think of oxygen unloading. So if there's very low affinity for oxygen, that means you'll have a lot of oxygen unloading because you don't want to hold on to that oxygen. You don't like it. No affinity for it. Okay. So when we talk about temperature or altitude, high temperature, high altitude, both will increase oxygen on loading, which tells you that they create a lower affinity for that oxygen. And so you can think of it as 
high temperatures denaturing the bond between oxygen and hemoglobin, if that helps you remember that with high temperatures, you have lower affinity for oxygen. And also with increased altitude, you have lower affinity for oxygen, which makes sense if you picture, you know, how difficult it is for people to breathe at high altitudes. Okay, so picture that and it will remind you lower affinity for oxygen. And so if you think about it with what we've learned so far, what would a curve, what would one of those graphs look like if you have higher temperature or higher altitude? The curve would shift to the right because it's shifting toward a lower affinity, okay? So I could easily ask you, you know, what would a curve look like for oxygen affinity if higher temperature is involved. And so the curve would shift to the right. So as we're talking about hemoglobin, I want to mention one of the illnesses related to it, sickle cell anemia. And what happens in this disease is you end up with a mutation in the hemoglobin and you end up having a glutamate getting substituted with valine. Okay, so I'm going to grab the laser. So in normal hemoglobin over here, part of the chain, you notice that you have glutamic acid or glutamate right over here. It's in position six. Now in sickle cell, the mutation has caused a valine at that location instead. Now the problem with that swap is that you had a, you you were supposed to have a polar residue at that location now you have nonpolar there so you end up with hydrophobic interactions where there's not supposed to be any and that will then reduce the oxygen carrying efficiency okay and once you have this kind of mutation and there's a problem with those blood cells now those those red blood cells get targeted for destruction by the spleen so you end up where normal red blood cells can live up to 120 days in the body, but sickle cell, because they're mutated in that way, the spleen quickly targets them for destruction, and they only end up living 10 to 20 days and then get destroyed. And not only do you have this reduction in the, the red blood cells and the reduced oxygen that goes along with this, but you also have the danger that when it's mutated and you see this sickle shape to it, now that weird shape that's not supposed to exist is going to end up causing the cells to pile up and clog vessels. And that's going to create things like really excruciating pain for the poor patients that are suffering from a sickle cell crisis because not only do you get pain from not having enough oxygen in the blood and in the organs and, and tissues and all but you're now also having these pileups and cloggings and vessels but what is interesting that that there is a kind of side effect benefit to this condition and basically it's that the reduced oxygen in the red blood cells of someone with sickle cell interfere with the parasitic growth of the parasite in malaria. And so people who have the sickle cell trait heterozygously, they're more resistant to malaria. So that mutation has kind of still existed or, you know, in the, in the world because the heterozygous formation ends up having an evolutionary benefit in that you get malaria resistance. So we've spoken a lot about hemoglobin as a protein. Now I want to switch gears into the membrane proteins. There are three different types that I want you to know. There are membrane receptor proteins, membrane-bound metabolic enzymes, and membrane transport proteins. And I then ask you a question of how do nonpolar and polar movements across membranes differ? And so if you take a look at the figure, nonpolar, Movement can occur by simple diffusion. So you're going from a high to low gradient and you don't need any assistance with that. 
whereas polar molecules, they're going to have to be transported across the membrane. And so you end up with these transport systems that can either be passive or active, but either way, they end up needing a membrane protein to help transport them across that membrane. Now, when we're talking about transport across a membrane, I want to remind you or, or bring up a concept that we've talked about before, which is free energy, which was delta G. And if you remember, when delta G is negative, that's when you have a reaction that's favored or spontaneous. And so if it is favored, delta G will be negative. That tells you if it's favored, you can just have passive transport for this event. Because if you think about it, you know, you don't end up needing any assistance if something spontaneous or favored. Whereas if something is delta G positive, that's going to need active transport. Now, here we're going to start looking at some of the passive membrane transport proteins. And one of the examples are bacterial porin proteins. What's interesting is some bacteria, you know, they have these porin proteins on their outer membrane. And that can be very troublesome for, for people and for the medical industry because that makes them a lot more selective as to what you could get into and out of them. So if it's a type of bacteria that has a lot of highly selective porins, sometimes they're more difficult to treat because we end up having more difficulty getting the antibiotics into those cells. So for instance, gram negatives tend to have a lot of extra porins on their outside. And so that makes them a little more difficult for us to treat. Now this porin structure, if you were to look at them, they're the common motif called a beta barrel. So they look like a little barrel. And the way that those structures are made is that it's a sequence of polar and nonpolar residues alternating. And if you think about what we've said previously about polar, polar is hydrophilic because water is polar and like dissolves like. So if you have polar and nonpolar alternating, it means that you end up having hydrophilic and hydrophobic residues alternating in a way that you could then arrange that beta barrel <clears throat> so that the hydrophobic residues face outward and the hydrophilic ones are charged inward. And so you could end up having the hydrophilic interact with the polar molecules that we said end up being transported through these special transport proteins, because we said polar need the help of a transport protein. Okay. Now, ultimately, whether they're very highly selective or non-selective, that ends up depending on the number of beta strands. And basically, that will impact how narrow or how wide the inner diameter of that barrel that porin is. And it will also end up affecting which chemical properties, which side chains end up at certain locations in that barrel structure. Now we look at aquaporins and even though their purpose is to transport molecules across, you know, these hydrophobic cell membranes, they're slightly different from the bacterial porins in a couple of ways. So first of all, these guys are specifically to transport water molecules across hydrophobic cell membranes. So that's their purpose. And you'll notice that instead of having that beta barrel structure, now what you're seeing instead of beta, you're seeing alpha. So aquaporins are made up of alpha helices, specifically six helices, and their selectivity is then determined by two of the helices that ultimately create what is like a, a little constriction point specific to, you know, a single wa water molecule size and structure. And it basically has a spot that has this tripeptide arrangement 
that is basically, you know, just prime for hydrogen bonding and, you know, grabbing that water to reorient the water and push it through that channel. Okay, so purpose is to transport water across the hydrophobic membrane, and the structural difference is that you now have alpha helices. Now we turn over to the active membrane transport proteins, and there are two different types. There's primary and secondary, and a lot of times the secondary ones, the way that they work is from having um, energy from the ATP-driven primaries to kind of fuel them. Now, you'll notice that there's two terms on here that I want you to know, which is the difference between antiporter versus symporter. And when you think of anti-porters, you know, anti means different directions. So picture that while you have one type of molecule exiting through that protein, you have another type of molecule entering through that protein. So the two different molecules being transported are moved in two different directions across the membrane. Whereas a symporter, you have two different types of molecules using that transporter, but you notice that they are both going in the same direction, either both entering across the cell membrane or both exiting across that membrane. Okay, so that's the difference between antiporter versus symporter. And then we get to one of my all-time favorite slides that I've ever made because I absolutely love that Elmo meme, and you can tell I start laughing anytime I talk about this one. Uh, but what we're doing here on this slide is we're bringing in another medical re relevance to the topics that we've been talking about. So just now we were talking about primary and secondary active membrane transport proteins, and in the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry, we can use inhibition of these transport proteins to help treat or, or do different things for the body. So the first example that I'm going to go through on this slide is Prilosec. Sometimes you hear this sold under the generic name of omeprazole. And so you might have heard this used for when people have a lot of like heartburn, acid reflux type of situations. And what happens is the Prilosec, or the omeprazole, will inhibit the gastric hydrogen potassium ATPase protein, the, the transport protein that's responsible for pumping protons into the stomach to lower the pH. So if you think about it, if this pro, uh, protein transport uh, is, is to pump protons into the stomach to lower the pH, to make it more acidic, then if someone's having problems with too much acid, too much acid reflux, you can inhibit that transport, inhibit that transport protein and help to treat them. Another example, what we use is over here is Zoloft and Zoloft or sertraline is basically used to inhibit the serotonin transporter protein, okay? And that transport protein is responsible for removing serotonin from neural synapses. And so if you are inhibiting the removal of serotonin from these synapses, then the serotonin will stay there longer which will then make you know the person happier. It's it's it will increase serotonin, which gives them the happier feeling instead of being depressed in their in their mood. Okay, because serotonin is the happy neurotransmitter. Then we get to <laughs> cocaine, and uh, it's it's always interesting to go from teaching you know how certain medications that people take to help them to switching over to cocaine, but it's actually very interesting to think about how cocaine works. And we're actually gonna talk about how we can treat that addiction in one of the other chapters of biochemistry too, because if you know the mechanism of how a drug works, you can then help treat the, the addiction for it. So what cocaine ends up doing 
is it inhibits trans, uh, dopamine transporter proteins. And so when you see in this figure here, normally you want transporter proteins to be able to remove dopamine from dopamine receptors and carry them back away from that synapse, from that you know triggering of the intense effect that dopamine can have on you. You know, dopamine is responsible for a lot of the addictions people have, whether it's to cocaine or something like, you know, as, as viewed as harmless and legal as candy, or even when you're addicted to people. So when you first meet someone and you have a huge crush on them, or you, you're in that honeymoon phase of love and you think, you know, they're the greatest person in the world and you feel so great with them. And even the rush of sex and all, a lot of that is based on dopamine hitting those receptors and giving you that feeling of ecstasy and, and happiness and excitement and all of those great, great feelings. And then you try to chase them again and again. So you're constantly looking for that dopamine rush. Now, in the case of cocaine, it is inhibiting that transport protein. So if you are inhibiting the removal of the dopamine from that receptor, well, now you are getting dopamine stuck on those receptors. So you are getting a prolonged feeling of ecstasy and, and high kind of feeling. And, and so it's basically blocking the recycling of dopamine back uh, into the original neuron. And so now you just stay stimulated with that, that dopamine. Okay. And so that's why, you know, the people who ha are using cocaine end up so, you know, um, so highly addicted because they are chasing that constant dopamine high. Now, when we talk about the primary active transporters, there are two of the most abundant types, which are P-type, the P standing for a phosphorylated, and ABC types. So of the P-types, these are going to use phosphorylation to basically drive their activities, whereas ABC are ATP binding cassettes. So they're ATP dependent and they'll have two ATP binding domains. And in the figure down here, I want to point out V class and F class proton pumps because you notice, I know it's a little blurry because the figure's small, but I want to point these out for two reasons. One, you notice they both involve ATP, but you see an opposite reaction here. So I want you to put a little star next to V-class and note that these are doing ATP hydrolysis because you see the ATP gets broken down into ADP plus PI. And then the F-class, I want you to put a little star and note that this is ATP synthesis or ATP synthase proteins. So you'll notice you go from ADP to ATP over here. And the reason why I want to point that out is because these F-class proton pumps are going to come up in multiple of the following chapters. So quite a few of the, the upcoming chapters, you're going to get to see ATP synthases in, in membranes. So I want you to remember this one. So put an extra little star next to the F-class proton pumps. So we just mentioned that the two major types of those primary active transporters are P-type versus ABC type. So I want to give you a couple of examples of P-type transporters. One big one that I'm sure you've all heard of is the sodium potassium pump, the sodium potassium ATPase transporter. And so as you see here, for every three sodium that are going outward, you have to potassium going inward, okay? And this pump is very important in terms of neurons firing and also for secondary active transport. And 
it's basically involved in uh, what's called electrogenic transmembrane resting, uh, resting potential. And you're going to see this in other classes and other lectures when you talk about synapses and uh, axons firing. Another example of a critical uh, P-type transporter is the calcium ATPase, and this one is going to pump calcium from cytoplasm into a part of muscle cells called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the point of that is to promote muscle relaxation. So its ultimate goal is to lower the intracellular calcium levels to promote relaxation of muscles. So it's basically going to be very important part of when you see muscle movement. Uh, and we're going to have a figure later on in this lecture to help visualize that as well. And sometimes you will see it called circa. So sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase pump, circa for short. So those are some examples of P-type transporters. Now this slide is to introduce you or briefly show you ABC transporters. Okay, and so again, you'll notice ATP now involved in those figures. And when we look at these transporters, the basic thing that I want you to remember is that they're analogous to an airlock mechanism where you would only have one door open at a time to prevent equilibration across an impermeable barrier. And so the example that they use in this figure is like with an astronaut and the unpressurized bay. And so it's important to only have one hatch open at a time in order to uh, properly work that system. And so you see a similar kind of figure over here, but now we're looking at the, uh, the solute concentration and, and transport protein to be that kind of airlock mechanism that you've seen here with the astronaut. Now, the transporters we've been talking about in the, the past few slides, those have been primary active transporters. Now I want to show you secondary active transporters. What's interesting with this is, well, first over here, you notice one of the primary active transporters that we've seen just a few slides ago. And the reason why you see this here is the primary active transporter was directly using ATP for that gradient. And now over here, the secondary active transporter, which is the example here, of sodium iodine now, instead of sodium potassium, the secondary active transporter is sodium iodine. And you notice that it's depending on stored potential energy that it gained from the concentration gradient that was created by ATP hydrolysis and the primary, the primary transporter over here. Okay, so the secondary one is using the gradient, the concentration gradient, in this case, it's using the sodium gradient to drive the transport of iodine. And so it got that gradient thanks to the primary uh, transporter that you see over here. Okay, another example of secondary active transport that's harnessing energy from a proton gradient, in, in this case, a proton gradient instead of sodium gradient, is the lactose permease that you see in bacteria. And so that's part of that uh, lac operon that you guys discuss in other classes like uh, genetics class. Okay, so for secondary active transporter examples, think of the sodium iodine symporter, which is usually uh, seen in the thyroid of humans, and also think of the lactose permease, which is usually seen in bacteria. And both of these are now harnessing energy 
from a concentration gradient instead of directly from ATP, which was seen in the primary active transporter. Okay, so the last thing I want to mention in this lecture that went on a little longer than some of the other lectures uh, are these structural proteins, and that's actin and myosin. And what they're involved in is muscle contraction and relaxation. So you being able to move is thanks to these lovely structural proteins. Actin, you'll notice, are part of the thin filaments. And so thin filaments contain actin, tropomycin, and troponin. And then ultimately, the actin is tightly associated with that tropomycin and they bind with that troponin that I just mentioned. Whereas the myosin make up the thick filaments and they're arranged as kind of like globular heads and, and have a tail look to them. And you'll see in the next slides that they basically are kind of like little oars, like the, the oars of a boat. And they're like little oars that will allow for the pulling or the contraction of that muscle and together, when you think of myosin plus actin, they make up what's called the myofibrils that are ultimately for the relaxation and contraction of muscles. And so this last little point is to summarize what's happening in terms of relaxed muscle versus contracting muscle. And I want to point out that this not only involves the structural proteins of myosin and actin, but it's also dependent on things like the calcium pump that we mentioned earlier. Because calcium ultimately uh, controls muscle contraction because it binds to the troponin that we mentioned in the thin filaments. And you end up getting a conformational change that exposes the myosin binding sites on actin. And once you have those myosin binding sites exposed, then like I said before, myosin can act like little ores. So these, these structures here with the head and tail, uh, the myosin can act like little ores that are pulling or contracting that muscle. Okay, so in the relaxed state, the tropomyosin uh, is blocking those sites and you can't have contraction, whereas once calcium enters the picture, it will allow for the myosin to be freed up, uh, sorry, the myosin binding sites to be freed up so that the myosin can now start to contract that muscle. And so that leads you to think of, you know, what we mentioned earlier, where in the relaxed state, you end up keeping calcium levels low with that pump. And so now before we end this lecture, I just gave you a little review question, which has the different pictures that you've seen earlier. Uh, make note of ATP and ADP, you know, what's happening to them that will help you distinguish which proton pumps or which uh, transporters or which. And then you can send me your answers in the Remind app. And that is it for today. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, just send me a message in the Remind app anytime, day or night. I have no life. <laughs> Thank you and have a great day.